A very good evening and welcome to the Gordon Institute of Business Science in Santon, Johannesburg, South Africa's economic heartland. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen. Now, South Africa's unemployment rate, estimated at 25%, is among the highest in the world and has kept the nation's credit rating at just a notch above investment grade at global rating agencies. And as the continent's biggest economy struggles to create jobs for its 12 million unemployed, politicians, economists, and South Africans are asking what economic policies are required to lift growth, create jobs, and address one of the world's worst income inequalities. And that's the hot topic on this inaugural edition of Meeting of the Minds, the great economic debate. We are honored to have some of the brightest minds in business and economics with us here this evening. In our audience, some of South Africa and Africa's leading captains of industry, as well as senior members of the business fraternity and fellow members of the press. Now please join me in welcoming the members of our distinguished panel. First in line, General Secretary of the Congress of South African Trade Unions. Please welcome Mr. Zuelenzima Vavi. Our next panelist sits at the helm of Business Unity South Africa, Mr. Jabu Mabuza. <laughs> and joining us this evening, Mr. Herman Mashaba, businessman and chairman of the Free Market Foundation of South Africa. Next is our Rose Among the Thorns, Ned Bank Senior Economist, Miss Nikki Weimar. <laughs> and finally, joining us from our bureau in Cape Town via plasma, Rob Davies, South African Minister of Trade and Industry and also a Central Committee member of the South African Communist Party. Thank you all for joining us this evening and thank you in advance for the valuable insights you will be sharing with us tonight. Firstly, I would like each of our esteemed panelists to set out in no more than 60 seconds their individual economic ideologies. General Secretary, let's start with you. I'm a worker. <laughs> <laughs> and I represent uh, the workers and uh, I believe that any economy that is not founded on the basis of uh, building a future, not for a few connected elite, but on the basis of uh, ensuring that the people are uh, liberated from the unemployment, poverty, and inequalities will fail in South Africa, just like it has failed elsewhere else in the world. Jabu? Well, uh, uh, we believe in the free market economy, uh, but uh, to talk about uh, our philosophy, uh, does need uh, to be seen in the context of the, our current situation. We're not having a business as usual. We all know what's happening around us, and it requires different ways to, to grapple with all these challenges, internal and external. Herman, you're up next, sir. I think for us as the Free Market Foundation, there's really four basic principles uh, to be so fully agree with. Uh, Firstly, it's obviously the protection of uh, individual uh, human rights, which where we believe uh, South Africans have got to really be given an opportunity to be individuals, not to really be part of a collective. Obviously, collectives you can have, but the first thing that you have to have is individual right. We believe uh, in the protection of the rule of law, 
we, put, we believe uh, the, in the free market principles, which is really something really quite fundamental for our economy to, 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 to function. We also really believe uh, in uh, uh, property rights. So property ownership, we believe uh, South Africans have got a right to really have the property, to own property and really be protected. And I think for us as a free, free market foundation, those are the principles that we, we prepare to really defend and advance. And Nikki, we've clearly set you out as the rose among the thorns this evening, so can you take the stage? <laughs> well, certainly I'm an economist, so clearly what I would like to see um, and uh, what we study is how to get South Africa to be a competitive modern economy. And I think it contains elements of of everything that all three gentlemen have mentioned. Uh, and it's really the combination of that and it's the balance of that that needs to be debated. And the process you go about it, the angle you take. Uh, but ultimately what we would like to see is a free, competitive and uh, certainly modern economy. And Minister, over to you in Cape Town. Well, good evening. I mean, I think that the only way that we're going to solve the problems of unemployment, poverty and inequality is that we need to place our economy on a structurally different growth path to the one it's been on uh, in uh, the period up to now. Uh, we can no longer carry on on a consumption-driven growth path. We can no longer carry on as a producer and exporter of primary products uh, to other economies. We've got to add value in our own economies, push forward uh, with our productive sectors. That's where job creation uh, is going to take place. We're immediately going to open up to our audience this evening. Nick Frangross, Global Equities. So I believe you've got a question for the panel. My question has to do with state control of uh, assets. One of the most important debates worldwide over the last 50 years has been privatisation or state control. And I want to focus on SAA. It could be the education system, it could be whatever, but let's get specific about SAA. If a state asset is underperforming and losing money, it is depriving the country because it's a black hole where the money is going. It's depriving the country of that money being used for the development of the country as a whole and particularly the poor people and the unemployed. My question is, when you have a situation like SAA, what benchmarks does government take as to whether this should be privatised or continue under government control? Who would like to answer that question? General Secretary? Well, uh, you are you're asking a, a wrong person. My starting point was that I'm a worker. <coughs> <laughs> And workers do not use SAA. <laughs> <laughs> and only the elite uh, do so. Ideologically, I, I favor a, a much more interventionist state that plays an active role in developing an industrial base, in providing leadership, and in owning strategic sectors of the economy for the purpose of redistribution of wealth from the rich and in the economy to the poor. Ideologically, that's where I stand. But will you ever see me doing for the nationalization of a, an elite project? No, I won't. Javu, immediately you want to respond. Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an unfortunate uh, but yet uh, a very uh, uh, appropriate uh, uh, example. I think our country needs to really decide what it sees SAA's role as. If SAA is being set up as uh, like any other enterprise that is to be driven by profit, uh, you do what you do in business. When businesses don't make money, you close them. However, uh, there may well be a role for an SAA with uh, my travel and tourism uh, head on, that uh, it could be a carrier whose task it is to drive tourism for the benefits that tourism brings to the economy. Uh, lastly, I, I don't think owning it has got anything to do with it. Uh, whoever owns it for as long as businesses are run on business lines, uh, the, the, the shareholder needs to understand the role of the shareholder, provide money, gets accountability, and employ the best people to run an airline, if it's an airline on commercial lines. Minister, can you add your voice to the issue at hand? Yes, I think that I would say that uh, there's a need for a series of public uh, enterprises 
performing strategic and developmental functions and in some cases but not in the case of the airline uh, also providing uh, services uh, to poor communities and I think that uh, that uh, has to continue to be the case uh, an airline that uh, links our country with important trading partners uh, who may not otherwise be connected up if we are talking purely commercially driven airlines. Uh, an airline that uh, connects us up in particular to the African continent is of strategic developmental importance. Now that may be a, a different case from whether or not uh, SAA managers and the boards and the CEOs and so on uh, were actually delivering on that mandate. And there may be also a, a different question which I think is how does the public and developmental mandate coexist with the other mandate which is uh, to make money uh, on a commercial basis. But I do think that in principle uh, very, very definitely uh, we need strategic uh, state-owned enterprises playing a developmental role. It's absolutely critical in the infrastructure rollout program. Nikki, let's get your response. Well, I think that uh, it is true there is a role for the state in certainly uh, developing infrastructure. But it is also true that one of the reasons we face the bottlenecks we do is because the state have not delivered. So if you look at why South Africa has underperformed from an economic growth perspective, it is really as a result of a lack of electricity uh, capacity, as a result of a lack of transport capacity, as a result of a lack of telecommunication capacity, um, as a result of a lack of logistical capacity. All of these really the prominent forces in delivering these sorts of infrastructure is the state. You can take it even further to um, look at social infrastructure, which I think is a key reason, the frustration among the population that there's no delivery on key social pro priorities, education, healthcare, all of that also resides in the state's um, hands. And it is an important role. Um, but clearly, if it's not happening, you need to maybe open up a little bit and say, well, why is that not the case? Shouldn't we be a little bit more innovative about the way we go about this? And isn't there perhaps a role for the private sector to become more involved in the provision of and generation and distribution of power, for example? Because without that, we cannot grow. I mean, I see you are eager to add well, your I voice. I think it's actually quite interesting for us to, to obviously be talking about uh, SAA Way because uh, SAA Way is because it's a topical uh, matter in our country right now where the government has just really committed another five billion rands uh, uh, in, 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 in bailout. And uh, I think for me, uh, I, I really take it uh, as something that I cannot really find uh, any sense in, in, in us actually bailing an, an airline when our people every day traveling from Alexander to Sentinel or Johannesburg, I think that is where we should really be spending money on and making life actually quite easy for, uh, for, for, for our people, traveling from one village to, uh, to the next. Today, public transport in this country is actually one of the most unfortunate situations. Unlike really the, the, the financing, uh, bailing out an airline that few of us can afford to fly in. I think it was interesting uh, Mr. Vavi, and I agree with him that I think for him as an, um, uh, as a, as an employee, he doesn't really use the airline. And I believe uh, we really need uh, people like him to really assist us in ensuring that our government can obviously see sense in this day. We need public infrastructure in this country. If you look at it as compared to other developed countries, our f public uh, infrastructure in this country really... Uh, wow. uh, is that not historic? I see we're not going to move beyond this topic, but go ahead, but is that, General Secretary. It's not historic that there is a... Something that looks like an argument between Corsato and, and, the, free and the Free Foundation. Market yeah. Foundation. <laughs> so business has achieved. I can only hope that this is real because I, I, I do agree that the biggest focus the state must, uh, must, 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 must put every of its assets on is on development of public infrastructure, in particular. Uh, the, the public transport system. So I hope that uh, you're going to be joining us soon when we, when we take your words into action in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, I think for, for, for me, for me I've, I've, always, uh, I've always admired what uh, Kosatu has done for their constituency. And, 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 and it's the kind of leadership that we need at a global level. You can imagine if we had uh, Mr. Vavi really being the global person. You can see when he represents his constituency, he does it so well. And unfortunate for him at the moment is only obviously, from a country's point of view, he represents a small constituency, which is good for him. So what we do is, how can we get Mr. Can Vavi to, to represent the whole country? <laughs> <laughs> right, now this is where I take the authority back, and I'm moving back to my audience. Matthew Birch from Gibbs, if you could pose your question, sir. 
good, good evening to the esteemed panel. Um, I think we've spoken about a lot of issues in the short period of time that we've uh, been discussing. My question's a little wider, and it's to the whole panel. Um, how do we reconcile uh, the division between empowerment and upliftment and driving competitiveness through our country? We look at countries north of us like Nigeria, Tanzania, Angola, driving at you know, 7 10% GDP growth, and we're trundling along at 2% and possibly below that. How do we drive competitiveness? How do we understand the meaning of competitiveness? And how do we drive that through everybody within the country to pull together? Because the reality is, is that as we look at emerging markets, dynamic markets, they seem to get the story better about competitiveness than we do. And I'd like to know how the panel could elaborate a little bit on how they would reconcile the upliftment of people, but yet driving competitiveness through in the economic sector. The question has been posed. How many are up I'll first? Nikki, you're second. I'll really deal with it, I think, from a free market foundation point of view, because, uh, as I said, the, if, if, the, the, one of the ba basic principles that we, we there to really defend and protect is uh, individual human rights. Allow uh, people to do uh, what they know best. I think all of us, God gave us the... Uh, uh, the intelligence to really be able to uh, really defend, defend for ourselves. We have to really stop a situation where, you know, as we believe that only the, we can only operate when we have the government uh, guiding us. And I think, uh, unfortunately, it's a very wrong fallacy. Government must just really be there to create, keep uh, the, the rule of law. But I think allow oh. the human beings uh, to flourish. And that's when you, you will see... General uh, Secretary is not very happy <laughs> with, with that comment, Herman. Nikki, I'm going to give you the platform. And I think it's also about creating an enabling business environment. So a competitiveness and an enabling business environment that is going to attract foreign direct investment. Yeah, certainly. You, you need a, a stable and a predictable investment environment. And that, uh, you know, it really includes almost everything that relates to the activity of doing business. Um, and in a country like South Africa, where we're running a current account deficit of 6.4% of GDP, we're running a fiscal deficit of over 4% of GDP. It really isn't a luxury. We can't really debate these things. We need foreign capital because we do not generate sufficient <laughs> capital and savings ourselves to expand our economy. And without capital expenditure and an accelerated pace of that, we are never going to create jobs. It's as simple as that. So quite frankly, yes, I think you need a flexible economy, but you also need a very um, stable and predictable environment. And that's where government can also play a very powerful role. And it costs them very little to do that. You just need to set a very stable environment. General Secretary, I'm going to let you stew a little longer. I'm going to go to Cape Town with this one. And Minister, I'm going to ask you to keep on your communist hat in your response. <laughs> yes, I, I think that the, the first point I would make about uh, competitiveness is that we need to understand our place in the world economy. Uh, and uh, essentially, it's not that we are going to be able as a society, nor should we, uh, try to compete through a race to the bottom uh, over wages and conditions. I think that is a completely fool's paradise, even if uh, some of us may think that uh, that may be a, a destination for us. Uh, no, I think rather we need to uh, identify ourselves as an industrializing value-added economy. And there's a lot of issues that then arise from that choice. Uh, they do include that we've got to improve the skills of our people, that we've got to uh, improve our technological capabilities, we've got to enhance innovation. It's bringing about the structural changes I referred to earlier. But I think there's another aspect to it, and that is what are we going to do with the mineral wealth that we have in our country? Are we going to uh, continue to export it as dirt out of the ground and hope that there will be a series of co commodity super cycles uh, as there have been in the last few years? And I think if we're going to go on that path, we're on a, on, on a fool's errand because uh, that's not going to be the way the world is shaping up in the next decade or so. So we have to actually make sure that we create a new fundamental competitive advantage for us in South Africa, and that is around access to mineral products to support beneficiation and to support industrial development based on that. And I think those are the big structural changes that we have to make in our economy. We have to accelerate all our efforts uh, in this regard. Uh, and um, I think that if we don't do that, uh, we're going to disappoint our people and disappoint our country. But that's the challenge, and uh, it's a big structural change that we need to be making uh, in the path of accumulation and development. And as far as uh, being a communist is concerned, uh, I think that we think that that's a social uh, and developmental path, uh, and that that is going to require uh, leadership from our, our government, from our state, 
uh, and also uh, from uh, our people and the working class in particular. Before we jump into the nationalization debate and our natural resources, General Secretary, your response on competitiveness and creating an enabling business environment. Well, uh, the first thing I want to say to the Free Market Foundation is that the type of a prescription they're giving to us of a police state or restricting the role of the state to law and order and, uh, and build prisons, privatize prisons. <laughs> no, and it is a recipe for a disaster under the, the today's conditions of South Africa. In fact, you will have to make the whole South Africa a prison first and, and, and get every of the people who are who participating in the 120 protest actions a year in the country in prison, including all of those who are on strike and uh, for a better pay today, put them in prison. That can't be the way to go. The way to go is to recognize first that South Africa is at the wrong place, is in the wrong place in relation to the structure of the economy. And that as long as we have, we're not succeeding to do some of the things that the good doctor is saying about uh, industrializing, beneficiating, uh, prioritizing education and, and, and leadership, because you can't fix economy without good political leadership nor can you do the anything without uh, 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 around leadership. One of the greatest disappointments, for example, is the whole fiasco of Limbombo and the lack of leadership to act decisively when those type of cases arise. And yet we all know that without fixing education, we will not get out of the current cycle of unemployment, poverty, and, in and inequalities. So that... <laughs> so, to me, we've, the, our problems are structural, and structural problems require leadership, and leadership is provided by progressive developmental states. That's what we need, not a police state. Thank you for waiting ever so patiently, Jabu. Yeah, I think the, the, I, I agree with uh, what the minister is saying. Uh, it is important that government do, does provide an enabling environment but I think the one word uh, is productivity. Uh, for us to be in a position to produce uh, quality products that are coming on time, uh, that are cost efficient, uh, and we can manage uh, to lower our cost of doing business, be the cost of transport, the cost of electricity, labor costs, and indeed uh, in dealing with labor costs, also deal with the issue of skilling our labor but also uh, the question of leadership is also a, ve a very important one. I don't uh, agree that uh, our problems were caused uh, by the free market, the free market must solve them. Our problems have been artificially created. They need our leaders to artificially get together and agree, firstly, what are the internal challenges? What are the external challenges? What it is that we, as business, labor and government, can do to confront them, recognizing they are peculiar to us. I think the one thing that we all agree on is that we have a triple challenge here in South Africa. Unemployment, poverty, and inequality. My question is, let's start with unemployment. Job creation. Is there a silver bullet, Nikki? No, I don't think there is a silver bullet. I think that in South Africa, the reason we have such high levels of unemployment, um, there is no doubt about it. There is a historical legacy behind it. Um, there's no doubt about that, that there is a truckload of injustice that has gone into that. And um, in a very simple terms, as a result of that, there is a huge structural element of um, insufficient levels of education, inadequate skills levels. Um, and clearly, education, skill development, um, all of those things really are the root to um, achieving, firstly, higher levels of employment and also better pay in the future. Um, but ultimately, you can also look at the structure of the labor market. And uh, it certainly increasingly is starting to look like it is an impediment to job creation. Um, and certainly, there is a very, very weak link between uh, remuneration in South Africa and productivity. So ultimately, we need to establish a labor market that rewards excellence, that rewards um, uh, productivity. Otherwise, we will not create the sort of environment the minister is referring to. 
General Secretary, the right to respond, sir. Well, uh, we've already mentioned the issue of industrialization. That's going to be the key. If we can succeed to build the industrialization base in South Africa, if we can support manufacturing, and I'm saying so despite the fact that uh, in the recent quart uh, 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 quarters, the, the industrial industrialization in South Africa have been taking a knock as a result of what we know is happening in the world. Europe is in crisis, China is cooling off, the US economy is in crisis, and, uh, and Brazil and India are cooling off. But that's where we've got to be focusing <coughs> on. What is that we can do to industrialize? We've signed a very important agreement with the government and business and community, and community on local procurement trying to mobilize South Africans to conscientize them and uh, to put them under pressure to act consciously in buying and promoting South African <coughs> manufactured goods. And, uh, and we think that South Africa's buying power is of such a magnitude that uh, we, can, we can promote local procurement and that, that's why we always favor, by the way, better wages, living wage, because we see a very strong connection between the increasing the buying power of ordinary people workers and, the manuf and building the manufacturing <coughs> economy or the industrializing economy in South Africa. Brazilians have done that exceptionally well in the past nine years or so, and we think that South Africa can succeed to do so as well. Jabu, what does business highlight as the single most important element when it comes to job creation? Look, I think uh, uh, I agree with Nikki, there's no silver bullet. Uh, but we, we do need uh, higher levels of growth that are job uh, uh, rich. We must also then recognize that 85% uh, of all jobs uh, are generated by the private sector. So the government can go a long way in enabling and inducing and incentivizing business to invest and create uh, these jobs. We've had growth uh, levels uh, up until 2008, but we as a country are guilty for not having created jobs. You're not gonna get jobs without growth. You've had uh, jobless growth, uh, but you cannot get uh, growthless jobs. So we need to also look at stuff like uh, our labor market. We need to uh, ask ourselves, I'm not in the league of like, this is wrong. We need to sit down and say, is our labor market regime appropriate for the now? Is uh, our employment of youth being addressed by our current situation? I don't think there's an answer that is gonna come at shouting between business and labor. We need to sit down and say, what is it in the current peculiar situation that we can do that would enable us uh, to create these jobs? Well, things are heating up here at the Meetings of Mind debate. Before we go to a quick commercial break, earlier this evening we asked our audience which economic policy ideology they thought would best suit South Africa. Communism, capitalism, socialism or a mixed economy. We'll be sharing the results with you when we return.